Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are our hope, our living hope. Amen. That goes back to a couple of Easter's ago. Praise the Lord. Resurrection Sunday. Luke chapter number 15. Let's get into the Word of God a little bit. So good to sing. Every week, sing praises to the Lord and know that He is pleased when we lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Throughout Scripture, we know that that's a hallelujah, praise, praise God, praise ye the Lord. We're going to use a few psalms today when we kind of bounce around a little bit in our text, but we're looking at Luke chapter number 15. We're going to finish out the chapter, and last week we only covered 10 verses, so we got to do a little bit of work, but it's a beautiful fit. And we know that uh, last week we talked about um, the first two parables, and this is the third parable. I mentioned this, and I look at this uh, text in the 32 verses of chapter 15 as three parables, yes, but really intertwined into one parable itself, and this is Jesus Christ making sure that we understand the joy that comes from someone who is lost coming to know Jesus Christ as Savior. It was just tremendous. I, uh, I thank the Lord. It, it couldn't work any more beautiful for me to stand up and preach and teach the Bible for a few minutes off of two testimonies of a young person and, and a younger person, a shorter and a taller, but uh, great testimony. And uh, Matthew, thank you for that testimony. Thank you Adeline, she's over to Faith Place, I'm sure, having a good time. Did she do a good job there, Mom? Awesome. Dad, good job. Way to go. Grandparents are here. So thankful. Mom is here. These are good, good, precious moments in the walk and faith of someone who uh, declares that they know Jesus as Savior. And they, again, as Brian said, it's, it's a testimony. I want to testify that I asked Jesus to save my soul every repent of the belief of being righteous or self-righteous. I repent of the belief that I can save myself. I repent of any of those beliefs that are contrary to Jesus Christ, our living hope. He is the one. And of course, Jesus said of himself, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And Jesus clearly made it so in his parable teaching. We know old Dr. Luke, he expounded more parabolic teaching than any of the other gospel writers. And I love this parable, and I love this series of parables to declare the statement that uh, once I was lost and now I'm found. Uh, I mentioned last week that last week was part one, so here's part two, pictures of joy. And that's really the the statement to me that I see coming through this text. Before we read this whole text, let me just highlight a couple of things. You've got chapter number 15 open up on your, on your tablet or your phone or on your lap with your Bible. The verse, verse 1 and 2 talk about the audience, and we like to know who Jesus is speaking to. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. We know that's the, all those people that say, boy, I need a Savior. And then, of course, verse 2. Pharisees and scribes murmured. Of course, they're the self-righteous, prideful bunch that's thinking, hey, I've obeyed every commandment in my life. How, what would I need a Savior for? And they said, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. It was common to know that in the accounting of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry, that he had no difficulty bringing the message of salvation to all the sinners, all the publicans, of course, for the scribes and the Pharisees. And today, as we look at the parable of the prodigal son and we read through it, let's just, just, just make it very, very clear here. There are two aspects to salvation. This salvation is very clear. The first part is to realize that you're lost. Well, that would come with the shepherd looking for the sheep, the woman looking for the coin. Hey, the declarative that something is lost and the need to go find it, that's... Jesus saying he is the son of man that has come to seek and to save that which is lost. God, throughout his Old 
covenant teaching throughout that was a precursor to the new covenant when the Messiah would come, the Lord Jesus Christ would come. So the second aspect, of course, is found here, the prodigal son. The shepherd and woman seek the lost, and they show that that's how God shows that he's going to seek. And of course, the prodigal son, we find out on the other side, the other aspect of salvation, he seek the Savior. Sometimes we just think because we're born into a church family or we go to church or you know, we say a few prayers or maybe we give a little or join a church that, hey, salvation has come to me. No, no. It has a whole lot to do with Jesus' teaching that you would repent of you and your belief system and turn to believe in Jesus and Jesus alone. The two aspects are very simple. Found in these 32 verses, shepherd and woman seek the lost. A prodigal son seeks the Savior who can give the salvation. It's a great, great statement of God's sovereignty, but also, of course, of man's responsibility. So again, with that being a little bit of a preview, let's read our scripture for the day. We've got a little bit of work to do, so let's get into it and use our time wisely in the name of Jesus by the Spirit of God. Verse number 11, pick it up with me. It'll be up on the screen. You can follow along on your lap, like I said earlier as well. And he said, Jesus, of course, speaking. A certain man had two sons, and we know this audience, again, from verse 1 and 2, is filled with publicans and sinners and Pharisees and scribes. And he says, And the younger of them, these two sons, said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. You've got to believe by just a couple of verses here, we know in this parable teaching that Jesus is conveying that this younger son had a plan. He, he's got a plan already. He's going to go and demand his inheritance, and we'll get into that a little more. And then, hey, I pack my bags, and I'm off to the far country. I'm going to be on a journey for myself. Verse 14, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. He'd gotten so brokenhearted, he had nothing of his own. Now he's in this world's system of life, and he's in this country, and he says, hey, citizen of the country who has a business, I'll go to work anywhere, anywhere and do anything. So verse 16 tells us what he's about to do. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. He would have eaten it, but he couldn't get any. Verse 17, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. He's at the realization that He doesn't have any food, so he's concerned about his physical side of things. But look at what happens spiritually speaking in verse 18. And I will arise. I will go to my father. I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, he could imagine the speech he had all planned. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. This definitely would be language of the time that people would understand because when they say, anybody says sinned against heaven, it's saying I sinned against the one who is the Holy One, the glory of heaven, the Lord God Almighty, he's really stating simply, I've sinned against all that is of God and in God. He recognizes the spiritual issue. Yes, I'm not going to get anything to eat physically, and so I'm going to die of hunger. But now spiritually, he rises and says, Oh, Father, I need you, because I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no worthy to be called thy son. Verse 22 down. 
But the father said to his servant, bring forth the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. I'm sure for so many of you, you've heard this story and you've heard this parable and you love it, don't you? Because we're drawn to the lost being found. We're drawn to the rejoicing and the joy of someone who is an absolute mess. And they come to the Father for salvation. They began to be merry. Now, if the story stopped right there, wouldn't you be happy? But why does Jesus go here? He's about to entertain another element in peace. We don't want to leave out the elder son. And so Jesus Christ brings him into the parable. And it's so important to understand. Without predetermining what and where, just read the text and let's see what Jesus is teaching. Verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He didn't even know that his brother was back. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. Don't you love that statement? There's not a parent on the face of the earth that doesn't want to make sure that their child would come on home. And they say, you're safe and sound. You're okay here. What's the response from the elder son? Verse 28. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. And as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured, hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. So here's the father in verse 31. He said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost, and is found. That's why we love this story. This prodigal son could be looked at in so many ways, and we'll look at him. Today I want you to look at the different elements and see it and let the Spirit of God show you and teach you and He'll speak to you if you just give him permission off of this scripture. But I want you to keep in mind paramount. The Son of Man, and it says up on the screen, it's our theme verse of our study. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. I mentioned it earlier. Please know that that aspect of salvation is so critical that without Jesus, well, Adeline did as good a job as anyone right there. And she spoke of, well, I want to be baptized. Well, we could do baptisms every week. We'll just have open swimming 52 times a year. Mom and dad say, no, no. I'm so glad that you've asked about swimming in the pool. But let me teach you about what baptism means. Because before baptism salvation must come to your soul. And a six-year-old child comprehending and understanding that Jesus is the light of the world, that he's the bread of life, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father, that she understood and memorized and could write out that if thou should confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Save from what? The punishment of my sin. Eternal damnation apart from Jesus Christ. To me, 
clearly the aspect of Jesus coming to find that which was lost is clear, is, is number one, is, it, it is what it is, number one. But the other part is that can sit there forever. And unless a child says, I would like to know that I can receive that. In fact, very simply receive, I just need to repent and believe, period. And a young man's accounting of reading through Scripture and then reading more than a carpenter and then sitting down to learn the Bible and saying, hey, in July, was it June? July, July 12th? Awesome, day before my birthday. Bam! I got saved on July 15th, 41 years ago. Yes! He says, I, I need to believe in Jesus right now. I need to repent of what I've done in these worky things. I'm going to trust by faith. Because it is for by grace that you're saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Why do you nail that down, Pastor? Because as I walk through the next few minutes with just these four simple things out of the text, I'm just going to walk through each one of them. I'm going to present a question after each one of them. What if it didn't go this way? And I'm going to walk through some things that God just put upon my heart, and we'll, we'll see where he takes things. You see, it could be said of the sheep that was lost because of their foolishness. It could be said of the coin it was lost because of carelessness. What about the lost son or sons? To me, <laughs> the sheep are foolish. The coins, somebody else was to take care of them. They're an atomic object, but somebody was careless with them. But the younger son, I'd say he was willfully, willfully and outwardly lost. The elder, maybe he's just pridefully lost. I don't know. The father says, I've had you with me, and you've been around me. But has he ever been converted? Has he ever asked the father to forgive in Jesus you see, the parable of the prodigal son is much beloved, as we talked about, because of the picture of joy it represents. Jesus' message to the publicans and sinners is filled with the message that the Father welcomes the lost who come to him with a repentant and believing heart. He welcomes people that come to him not with self-righteousness, not with conditions, not with an agenda. Hey, God, I will give my life to you, and I'll let, let Jesus you know, save my soul if dot, dot, dot. No, no. No conditions here. The condition is a repentant heart and a belief system only on Jesus Christ. Look at those Pharisees and scribes as well, because they're in the audience and they're part of this parable teaching. You see, prodigal means wasteful. It can be safely stated that the prodigal son willfully became lost upon his own volition. He went off to waste his life. Clearly, that's what's in this parable. His father granted him his desire to go even though he knew it was a bad decision. Oh my, we'll look at the father here again and the son and then the elder son at the end. But I wonder, can any of us, can you relate to the story of the prodigal son. Some would say, well, it's applicable to the salvation story of someone who's lost, but what about the person who's converted? They know Jesus Christ is Savior. No question, they lived for Christ for five, six, seven, ten years, and then they decided, hey, I just want to go out and find out what I'm here for. I want to I wanna see things. I want to experience this life. Now, see, that born-again believer is going to have a great deal of reproof, conviction. They're going to know that God is correcting them along the way because true salvation means that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and there is more than just conscience speaking. And this son, the younger son, pictures someone that says, hey, I need to grab what I can grab, and on my, my way, I've already willfully decided the younger son, he did have a right to request his portion, but the thought of himself and his flesh was more paramount than him saying, hey, Father, I want the inheritance to do something great for our family before you die. In fact, I put this up here, and I'll just walk it out for a moment. What about the father in this parable of the lost son? The young man demanded his inheritance as if he wished his father's death because he's going to get 
his inheritance at his father's death, correct? The scriptures teach in the law in Deuteronomy that the older, the elder son would get two-thirds of the estate of everything that the father had, his living, and the younger would get a third. When he asked for it, demanded it early, the father, okay, you can ask for it and you can get it, but understand this, there's no more inheritance after this. You're getting what you're going to get. And it is said by some teaching historically that he probably got less than a third. Because again, it was part of the culture and part of the law and the disposition of the estate. Hey, this is the way that it's going to be. We're going to dispose of the state at death, but now you say you want to do it now. And clearly the scripture, Jesus Christ holds to the whole letter of the law. See, at the end of all this, as I'm painting a picture of the difficulty and the roughness and the hardness in the life of the sinner, there are pictures of joy. I, I just want to remind you of the title of the message. It is Pictures of Joy, and it is the second part of seeing where, hey, look at verse number five for a moment. It says, hey, when they found the sheep, they were rejoicing. Rejoice with me, verse 6. Verse number 7, likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. We understand the text and the context. Verse number 9 says, hey, what about that coin? Rejoice with me, for the lost piece was found. Verse number 10, likewise, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God. There's joy in rejoicing. I remind you of verse 24, where the father says, hey, we began to be merry because we are so thankful that this lost son has come home. It says in verse number 32, the last verse of the text here in this parable story, it was meet that we should make merry and be glad. This is a story of pure joy, but there is some rough times within it. So I just want to, again, show you some support lesson points like I always do see where God takes us. I'll use some psalms, as I mentioned earlier, and a question on the other side of each. Let me show you the first one. Not everyone will be joyful. I put that as the top of each one of these. I look at the Father first. I see the Father is permissive and purposeful. So he's a permissive and purposeful Father. On the other side of it, the publicans and sinners, to me, would identify with the rebellious son, while the Pharisees and scribes would despise him for his wasted life. You say, ah, gosh, yeah, I got you, Pastor. I mean, that's clearly true, and, and I, I've heard messages about this text and everything. I want you just to, to track in here for a moment. Understand this, Father. He is permissive. He is purposeful. The publicans, they were probably looking, go, okay, we can identify with a rebellious son, we're, we're the same. But the Pharisees, they would despise him for his wasted life. How many times have you seen someone be criticized for their desire to be the lost son in the family? Maybe you've been part of that group. Maybe we all have. In fact, I can think of myself saying, why would somebody dot, 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 and you realize that this father is an incredible example for each one of us. He gives his son, who is really demanding here, his inheritance. He goes off to a far country. What's it say there? In verse number 13, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. You may say, gosh, I've never gone that far away. You know what? The far country can be you taking your heart and walking away from God. It could be you and I just saying, God, I made up my mind to do life my way. I know you've talked to me. You've spoke to me. I've gone to church a little bit. I've heard this and I've heard that. But I'm going to reject your will, Father, holy God, and I'm going to find out what sin can do to me. We know the old phrase that we take all that we have to buy into this idea that sin will really fulfill. But at the end of it, we realize that when we run out of the money and we run out of the resources to go after sin, 
It doesn't give us anything back in return. When you think of how many people have wanted to go find themselves, the prodigal son was very simply a man that took the father's beautiful, permissive will and took his purpose and said, okay, I'm going to live in sin. And I look at that and say, hey, what about a safe person that does that? Well, a safe person can do similarly if they live for the flesh. They're still converted. They're not going to lose their salvation. But they could live in a place of having sin forgiven, but rather living in sins that they seemingly think it's going to give them pleasure. This father was so incredible, so permissive in his way, saying, hey, father, he's going to willingly accommodate his younger son. The son makes a request, a demand. He says, hey, I'll be gracious and I'll be generous to you. In fact, I put up this question and I said I would do for each one. What if the father was not gracious and had not been generous? Go to Psalm 86 for me. You say, I would never let my son or daughter take their inheritance ahead of time. I'll stop them. They're never going to live like that. Okay. In fact, they're out of my house. They're not going to do what I told them to do. They're out. Okay. So here's the father showing us this incredible picture of his hope and his desire and what he would love to see happen in his younger son's life. Keep in mind this, as we read the Psalms, we're listening, we're reading, we're getting into the life of David, and many of them, this is a simple psalmist if they're not identified, but in this one, in Psalm 86, we see the prayer of David. And we see this incredible statement, this incredible words of contentment through a rough time in his life. We pick it up in verse number 14. Oh God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul and have not set thee before them. But thou, O oh Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Some of you I say, boy, this has got to be the prodigal son. That's what you're portraying. Stop for a minute and realize that what God has led me to say in reading this is this is the prodigal father. This is the permissive and purposeful father saying this to God. Verse 16, Oh, turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thy handmaid. Show me a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed because thou, Lord, hast hope in me and comforted me. The Lord is gracious and compassionate and long-suffering and plenteous in mercy. And this prodigal father over his prodigal son is saying, Lord, I come to you and I want to follow what you're showing me to do. Not everything, not everyone will be joyful over this, but I'm going to be this permissive and purposeful father. What is the second one I have up there? Not everyone will be joyful in this area. They'll see a forgiving, and I hope you see this forgiving and forbearing father. He is forbearing. He is withstanding. He is holding it together. He's saying, I don't love your behavior. I don't appreciate you coming to me and demanding your inheritance. But here's the father saying, I will forbear and I will forgive. In light of that, the publicans and sinners... They would encourage the repentant son. What would the Pharisees and scribes do? They would question his genuineness for coming back to the father. They would question the father and who he is. See, Pharisees are around all the time. They have all the answers. They know why things are like they are. They, and if they don't, they're going to tell you how they're going to find a solution to why God did what God did. And despite this young man's sin, the father forbeared and the father forgave. Can we not be a little bit more like this forbearing and forgiving father? 
when he comes to the realization of his brokenness in verse 17 and verse 18. He says, I will arise and I will go. And then you see in verse 20, and I included this with 17, 18, and 19, some separated out. I love how it just really comes together. Verse 20, and he arose. He said in 18, I will arise, but then he acted in verse 20. And I've got to think that these Pharisees and scribes, when they see this, they're going to say, well, what did the Father do giving him permission <laughs> to do this? But what we see in the Father is so godly. When he saw him a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You can preach about that for an hour. Would not a fellow fellow servant, a fallen servant, want this treatment from the Father? Wouldn't you? A lost person? Aren't you thankful for someone that would say, don't worry about being too good or being good enough. Jesus Christ is all you need for you to be saved. You can never be good enough. What if this father abandoned his post? I put up there, what if the homestead The estate was not standing and had not survived. What if? What if the father says, my life is done. My my younger son has left me. He should be married and having kids by now. He took his inheritance. Go to Psalm 103 with me. You see that estate that's waiting hasn't moved an inch. It's where God is. It's in the presence of the Lord that we'll be when we take our last breath as believers. Heaven hasn't moved. God hasn't moved. The Father in heaven continues to be steadfast and faithful and unmovable. And we know that in this picture here, what if the Father said, my son, he can, my older son, you take the place. Me and the, we're out of here. We're gone. I, my life is wrecked. You'd probably say, yeah, I guess. It says in Psalm 103, verse number eight, it behav- behooves us reading it. Let me just read it. And just, I want you to listen to the grace and mercy of the Lord. This is the Father tapping in to who the Lord is in his goodness. The Lord is merciful and gracious, verse 8, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy, will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. How is it that the Lord is to do this? He saves our souls. We're the fathers and the mothers and the, and the keepers of the homestead. And yet, we'll abandon this principle. We'll abandon the Lord's ways. The Father, in this parable, never abandoned the ways of the Lord. This is good fatherhood. This is good parenting. This is the way that we are to be. Verse 13, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone. The days will be gone before you know it, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto the children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The father couldn't. He couldn't leave his estate. He couldn't leave the Lord. He couldn't leave his homestead. But what if he was not standing and he didn't survive the onslaught and pain of his broken son's life? He was right there when he came back. That's powerful. Third and fourth, and I'll be done. Thirdly, not everyone will be joyful. 
You see, I see the Father now as beyond being permissive and purposeful, beyond right there being (laughs) such an incredible Father to forgive, I see him as a rejoicing and restoring Father. The publicans, the sinners, they're overjoyed for the restored Son, while the Pharisees and scribes, they're going to say, when's the next time he falls? When's the next time he fails? We've done so much for him at the church. We've done so much for him. We have people disciple him three, four times. That's what the Pharisees are going to do. Publicans and sinners are going, hey, <laughs> I can't get my act together, but I'm overjoyed for you getting your act together. Go to Psalm 116 as I state, what if the younger son was not repentant? and had not returned. What do you do now? What do you do if your child never comes back home? I know we have all the spiritualization and the quaint words. I'm sorry for you all that you don't understand they don't work. This is what works right here. What if your younger son does not return home? What if your child doesn't come back? It says in verse 1 of Psalm 116, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sours of death can pass me, and the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Just think of the father talking to the Lord about his brokenhearted son. Then called I upon the Lord, the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee, for thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. What if the younger son was not repentant and had not returned? But the joy is that he did. The joy of seeing the restoration of this young man. Because it says in Luke 15, the father said to his servant, Bring home the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, the signet of your mind, shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf, kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Oh, what a forbearing and forgiving father. I would suggest to all of us that we reside in that place if our children go into a far-off country. Consider this, as I said earlier, the far-off country can just be you and me turning our hearts and our lives away from Father God. You don't have to physically go somewhere down the road. Lastly, not everyone will be joyful A long-suffering and loving father is who I see lastly. He's permissive and he's purposeful. He's so gracious and good. And here I see him being long-suffering and loving as a father. You see, the publicans I see would be heartbroken over the elder son, would they not? Because publicans, the sinners, they know, hey, You older son, you shouldn't talk like this. You shouldn't act like this. 
while the Pharisees and scribes, they would commiserate alongside of him. What do the parents do to mess up their child's life? Why did they raise their children right? What did they do wrong for the children to go off and wander? The Pharisee and scribe always has a couple of extra tips for everybody. But you know the publican and sinner? <laughs> Have you ever been to a recovery meeting? They're all on there cheering for each other. You're getting it together. Way to go. I'm happy for you. I, I hope I can get it together someday. Of course, most of all, they need Jesus in that setting. What if the elder son was not envious had it not been egotistical, what would that have looked like? Psalm 105. I mean 145, and we'll finish. This is a good one. These psalms are giving you a little preview of our Acts 1-8 conference. Hint, hint. So did the music today. Thank you, Dwayne. What if the elder son was not envious and had not been egotistical, then maybe he would be long-suffering and loving like his father. Whatever happened to long-suffering and love for people? Did we just decide that that's not important? I remember my first bunch of years of salvation being trained and taught to be so hard on the children, and I, I know what's right, I know it's in the Word of God, but boy, oh boy. I did it with an awful lot of envy over others' children. I did it egotistically because I wanted to be something. Oh God, thank you for your mercy, your graciousness, your long-suffering. You see, the long-suffering and loving Father, not everyone will be joyful over how he approached it. Of course, we know this, this incredible story came out really, really well, but we do have this elder son to deal with, and Jesus puts him in the story. And I would just say that here's this incredible Father still dealing with the other son, with the same love and the same long suffering as he had with the son that ran away and came back. There's something special about this father, and I want to be like him. We need to be like this kind of father because he's like the father in heaven. I will extol thee, Psalm 145, my God, O king. I will bless thy name forever and ever. Oh, this is David's psalm of praise. Every day will I bless thee. I will praise thy name forever and ever. This has got to be the Father's life. This has got to be our life. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Our gener one generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. Here it is, verse 8, verse 9. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. That's the father that's standing there waiting on his son to come home. That's the father dealing with his son at home whose heart has been hardened and whose neck has been stiffened by self-righteousness and pride. I put up this last slide for our invitation. For this, my son was dead and he's alive again. Wouldn't that have been so good? I knew I was going to have a hard time with this. What is our heart attitude toward a prodigal's repentance and restoration? 
would we be so gracious and merciful like our Father? Why don't you join me for a word of prayer? Please stand. Please stand. Let me pray for you, pray over you, pray together with you. Maybe in this invitation time, say, boy, I need to check my heart attitude toward the prodigal. What would I be like? What kind of father will I be like this father in the story, the parable of Jesus? Maybe today you're lost. You're the lost kid, the prodigal. You want to come forward and make things right with the Lord? You want to get saved? You want to come to know Jesus? I'll be here after service. Come up and talk to me if you would. Father in heaven, we come to you in this precious, precious time. The whole morning has been incredible. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for being rich in mercy and gracious, slow to anger. Oh, you're plenteous in mercy. Thank you for giving grace through your Son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for being the Son of Man who has come to seek and to save that which is lost. God, do what only you can do in our hearts and lives. Make this a supernatural time. In the name of Jesus, by the Spirit of God, it's in your name we pray. Amen.